Welcome everyone to the 11th part of Verils 2021 Employment Law Update. Um, we thank you all for joining us today as we discuss responding to accommodation requests. Um, today's presentation is going to be given by myself, by Liz Johnston and Emily Coombs Waddell. Um, a brief introduction of each of us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tani Alvarez. I am a partner in Verrill's Labor and Employment Practice Group. I've been with the group for approximately nine years, and my practice is both advising and litigating on behalf of clients. I'll turn it over to Liz to share a little bit about herself and then Emily, and then we'll get started with content. All right, thanks, Tani. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Liz Johnston. Uh, pleased to be here with you today. I am an associate attorney in the Labor and Employment Group at Verrill. I've been here for just over three years. Um, and before that, I was at another small firm in Portland and uh, was a clerk at the law court in Maine prior to that. Um, my practice, like Tani's, also focuses on advising and counseling on employment matters, as well as uh, state and federal litigation. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Emily Waddell. Um, I have been with Veral now for almost a year, um, as of next week, I think, um, which is very exciting. Uh, and before joining Veral, I worked um, in human resources and labor relations at Pratt & Whitney, um, now part of Raytheon Technologies. Great, let's get started with that first slide. So we always say that it's important for everyone to know where we're going during the course of the presentation. So today we're going to talk about disability accommodations and religious accommodations. But in having those discussions, we're not only going to talk about times in which you're going to need to provide a disability accommodation or a religious accommodation, but we're also going to be weaving in best practices for responding and inserting some hypothetical scenarios and discussing best practices on responding to those requests. So that is kind of where we're gonna go throughout the course of the material. I welcome you to use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. So where it says Q&A, please, please, please use that. Send us questions throughout the course of the whole presentation. I'm going to be watching that very closely and we'll respond to questions that individuals have during the course of the presentation. So with that, let's turn it over to Emily to start the dialogue about disability accommodations. Great, thank you, Tani. Um, so this is a little overview of what we're going to be talking about today as it pertains to disability accommodations. Um, so we're going to start with a quick overview of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So who's covered under the ADA? Um, first, from an employer perspective, um, employers with over 15 employees who engage in interstate commerce are going to be covered by the ADA. Now, what I would say here is if that doesn't apply to your organization, I would be mindful that depending on the state in which you operate, there might be state anti-discrimination laws to be mindful of. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind as we flip through these slides that there might be a state law that applies to you if the ADA does not specifically apply. When we think of who is covered under the ADA from an employee perspective, the ADA recognizes three classes of protected employees. The first are those employees with a record of disability. So that's somebody who has a history of a physical or a mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Now, there's a lot in that definition. We're gonna break that down on the next slide. Um, but for purposes of coverage, there are two other classes that I wanna mention. The second class is going to be um, employees who are regarded as disabled. So these are employees who um, are perceived as having a disability, although they may not actually have a disability. Um, they're offered protection under the ADA. And finally, the last class are going to be employees who are associated with someone who is disabled. So while not um, disabled themselves, they have a relationship with someone who is, and that could be a family relationship, a business relationship, or some other type of social relationship. <clears throat> 
um, what is the disability under the ADA. So remember on the last slide, we talked about three different categories of employees who are covered. So depending on the um, category of employee that you're doing the analysis, the definition might change a little, um, depending on if they're regarded as or associated with. But for purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus on employees with a record of a disability. So a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Breaking that down a little bit, um, let's start with major life activities. So the ADA regulations um, contain an exhaustive list of what is considered a major life activity. And just to give you a sense of that, um, it includes activities like caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, um, among others, and in addition to um, operation of major bodily functions. So things like normal cell growth, functions of the immune system, et cetera. So an incredibly broad um, category of major life activities there. When we look at substantially limits, I think this is something um, really worth focusing on just because it comes up so frequently when we're talking about what is a disability. Um, basically what the ADA says about substantially limits is they look to several rules of construction to help figure out, employers figure out what this means. And it's really um, a comparison. So you look at the employee with um, the disability and you compare their ability to perform a major life activity to other, um, to the general population, to an employee in the general population. Now, this doesn't need to be something that requires a whole lot of scientific, medical, um, or statistical analysis. It's truly just a comparison. Um, and it's really intended to be construed broadly. So it's not um, something that you have to you know, overanalyze. Um, it, you're gonna look at the employee with the disability without any mitigating measures. So if we think of someone who has difficulty um, with their eyesight or with their hearing, you're going to judge their ability compared to the general population without the use of aids, like hearing aids or glasses or anything like that. Um, and you know that's kind of the, the intent of the substantially limits that comparison. And I think it's important to note too that this doesn't have to be something that an employee, you know, has for a certain amount of time. Um, even, you know, a condition that lasts for less than six months is going to be covered under the substantially limits um, comparison. So that's a lot. It's it's very broad. Um, there's a lot that can fall into that. Are there any exclusions from what is a disability under the ADA? And the answer is there are. Um, so it's very specific. It could be things like current illegal drug use where the person is in a supervised rehabilitation program though, or if they've completed a rehabilitation program, they're not going to be, they will be covered as having a disability. Um, but if it's current illegal drug use independent of that assistance, it wouldn't be. Um, and other, uh, other things like kleptomania or pyromania also um, would not be covered. So um, accommodation requests under the ADA. So, you know, in an ideal world, this would be very clear um, to employers. An employee would come forward and say, you know, hey, I need an accommodation. Here's what's going on. And you'd be put on notice. However, I think we all know, you know, things can operate differently in the real world. So really, you know, if an employee doesn't ask, um, I think it's important to remember that there aren't any magic words under the ADA that an employee has to say to be entitled to an accommodation. On the one hand, you as the employer, you don't have a duty to speculate as to what your employees need. Um, however, there are other ways that you could become aware that someone needs an accommodation that aren't the employee coming to you um, and specifically asking. So one of those might be that the employee's family member or friends reaches out to you and says, hey, you know, I don't know if you know that so-and-so is going through this thing and, you know, they really need X, Y, Z. Could be a healthcare provider or some other type of a third party. Um, maybe no one comes in and asks you, um, but there are situations where you could be put on notice effectively. Um, and those would be if you already know the employee has a disability. Um, if you know or you should know that the employee is experiencing a workplace issue um, due to their disability. Or if the, you know that the disability um, prevents the employee from requesting a reasonable accommodation. 
So there's a whole lot going on there um, that you just have to be aware of um, when dealing with an employee who might need an accommodation. And I think we all, you know, have a sense of what accommodations are, um, but it really could be anything. Um, it could be a modification of the work schedule, um, light duty or telecommuting, um, or restructuring of the job, but only to the extent um, that you're not relocating the essential functions of the job. And we'll kind of get to that when we talk about best practices. Okay, so once you become aware um, of the need for an accommodation, that is where the interactive process begins. So the interactive process is an informal practice where the covered individual and the employer determine the precise limitations created by the disability and how best to respond to the need for an accommodation. Both parties have obligations in this process. Um, on the one hand, the employee has the obligation to provide the employer with enough information to determine a reasonable accommodation, and the employer has the obligation to consider and explore potential accommodations. Both parties need to go into this process with good faith um, and really seek to kind of come to an understanding of what can be done. Um, employers, it, it is worth noting though that employers aren't required to provide the specific accommodation requested by the individual. Um, under the ADA, um, employees are entitled to a reasonable accommodation, but they aren't entitled to the specific accommodation that they request. Um, there might be other options as you begin this process that become um, gleaned from going through and having conversations um, that might not be what either party thought in the beginning would be possible. So there are two situations where um, an employer does not need to provide a reasonable accommodation. Um, and they're very, very specific. Um, and so we're going to kind of talk through them here in more detail. Although I would say, you know, before making a determination that you're not going to offer an accommodation, I would recommend speaking to counsel about it just because they're very um, kind of narrow and tailored exceptions. So undue hardship. Um, this really is, you know, what it sounds like. It's the accommodation would pose an undue hardship to the employer. So the courts are going to look at the nature and the net cost of the accommodation, the overall financial resources of a covered entity, um, the overall size of the covered entity and the number of employees employed, and the number, type, and location of the covered entity's facilities. So this really kind of becomes an analysis of the resources that the company has available and assessing whether or not an accommodation is truly an undue hardship. So you can imagine, you know, if someone needs, say, um, you know, a mobility device or something to get around a really large um, shop floor or situation facility, um, you know, if it costs $15, $100 and the employer is a Fortune 50 company, a court might not see that as an undue hardship given the resources available to that organization. Um, the second exception here is a direct threat. Um, you know, some disabilities pose a direct threat to the health and safety of individuals in the workplace. Um, and where there's no reasonable accommodation um, to accommodate that direct threat, employers um, can cite to this defense and not be required to provide an accommodation. Um, I think this one is kind of harder to conceptualize sometimes. Um, an example that I might think of is if you have, um, say, someone who works in a um, heavy manufacturing facility and one of their jobs, they're a machinist and they have to put a part on a machine and clamp it down and run the machine. And maybe they are suffering from dementia or something like that and they are forgetting a step in the process and they're running the machine and the part goes flying and it could hit, some, hit someone, hurt someone, kill someone, what have you. Um, in that example, if there's no other option for that employee um, where they're away from the heavy machinery, maybe they're doing something like washing a part or whatever, something else that's not going to result in that happening, um, the employer would be okay to um, not provide a reasonable accommodation if there's nothing that that, that employee can totally do. You know, we can get into a whole analysis is that, you know, that's unique to the organization, what other options are available for that employee, but something like that where others are, are put at risk um, by the disability. 
Um, and courts with that are going to consider the duration of the risk, the nature and the severity of the potential harm, um, the likelihood that that harm will occur, and how soon the harm will occur. Um, but both of these really require a case-by-case -case analysis to make sure that all of the criteria are met. So a thanks. couple of, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, thank, um, thanks Emily for, for that background. Um, Cause I think it's really helpful for all of, um, for, for everyone who's joined us. Um, now, if we're going to um, kind of talk about how we take all this information that Emily's just given us um, in a condensed format and how we use best practices to, to move forward, one of the things that Emily, Liz, and I hear a lot from clients is this discussion. Um, well, they mentioned they were going to the doctors because they were having issues, but I told them, I don't want any more information. I don't need to know about that, right? A lot of um, operations managers and a lot of people who are, are junior in the HR world will say, as soon as I start hearing information about a health condition, I shut down. I tell them I don't want to know anymore. But that can be problematic because the individual may be preparing to tell you a, a health condition in which they're looking for an accommodation. Recall how Emily said that there's no magic words. You don't need to say, I have a disability. You don't need to say, I need an accommodation. If an individual comes to you and says, um, I'm really stressed out because I'm going through a divorce and my doctors prescribe medication and, and anti-anxiety, but it's causing me to lose concentration and that's affecting how I do my work. You have enough information to know now that this individual potentially ha has a disability that that disability may be interfering with their ability to do their job. And you're now in a position where you need to begin to have an accommodation dialogue. It may be that form the essential functions, but you're not gonna know that until you have a dialogue with the individual and get a sense as to what the disability is, how it affects the essential functions and whether or not you could um, make a reasonable accommodation for that individual. Understanding, so that's the first thing for best practices. The second thing is understanding the interactions that occur when we're talking about disability accommodations between workers' compensation, the Americans with Disabilities Act or a Fair Employment Practices Act at the state level and the Family and Medical Leave Act, as well as how all of these interact with other state leave laws or federal leave laws. Oftentimes individuals find themselves just in one mindset and they forget that there's overlap between all these other statutes. So if we have an individual who has a work-related injury, they also could be disabled under the ADA and they also could be entitled to time away from work under the FMLA um, as a result of a serious health condition. Now this creates serious, serious issues because the Family and Medical Leave Act is a statute that's designed to keep people out of work for up to 12 weeks. So we know the goal of FMLA is to keep people out. The goal of the ADA is to keep people in work and changing or accommodating and making changes to the job to make sure that they can accomplish the essential functions. While the workers' comp statute is really focusing on just getting a person back to work. They don't care about essential functions. They want to get people back to work in some capacity as quickly as possible. So you need to understand how all three of these interact with each situation that you're dealing with concerning disability accommodations. The next aspect of, of best practices is, is having strong and up-to-date job descriptions. So if you have job descriptions that don't set forth the essential functions of the position, whether it be from an operational standpoint, from a physical standpoint, from a mental standpoint, you're doing yourself a disservice because you're going to be unable to appropriately respond to requests for an accommodation. Because if it's not listed on 
the job description, but it's something that's regularly occurring, it's hard to say, okay, well, you can't do something that's not on your job description and that's an essential function, so we can't accommodate you. So that job description, the paper itself needs to stay up to date and it needs to appropriately set forth what the expectations for the position are. The, the next best practice is to involve healthcare providers in, in discussions concerning accommodations. Most of us are, are not doctors. We don't have um, health care training, medical licenses, anything to that effect, which means that we don't know all the things that an organization can be doing to assist in um, making sure or creating an environment that works well for um, the individual. I would highly recommend a website called JAN, the Job Accommodation Network. This website provides a host of different disabilities and ways in which accommodations could be provided depending on different tasks or, or expectations. But really involving the healthcare provider in the dialogue and discussion is helpful. As Emily mentioned earlier, there's no requirement that we accept the accommodation that's being requested by the employee. And just because the accommodation requested is an undue burden doesn't mean that the dialogue or the conversation stops and that we don't have any obligation moving forward. Instead, we're going to need to continue to think about whether or not there are other things that we can do to help the situation. Um, Next, be open-minded as to both the disability and the possible accommodations. There are very few situations or circumstances in which we will get information back and say, well, you're not disabled. We situation or the condition that you have doesn't interfere with daily living activities to the effect that you're disabled. So first, in most situations, we're going to accept that there is some form of a disability, unless we're talking about one of those very specific circumstances that Emily set forth, such as current drug use, um, kleptomania, those type of situations. We then are also need to be open-minded about possible accommodations. So often, Liz, Emily, and I hear from a client who the individuals come to them and requested an accommodation that the organization knows just on the face of it isn't going to work. So they don't have a further dialogue because they say it's not going, it's not going to work. So why would we waste our time in discussing it? we still have to go through the full analysis. We still have to have a dialogue, the reasonable accommodation dialogue, figuring out if there is something more that we could do to help that person be successful in the organization. And then finally, um, we're, gonna have, we're gonna have to be aware of and understand comparator data within our organization. So when we say comparator data, what we mean is, are there other individuals who have been in that position who have received an accommodation? And is there an argument that could be made that we treat people who have uh, back injury better than we treat people who have um, mental health concerns or who are pregnant. So in each position, we need to understand what accommodations we've made in the past, whether or not it's for workers' comp injury, whether it's because of a disability, and make sure that we're following a similar standard across the board. Let's jump into some hypotheticals here. So hypothetical one goes to one of the questions that we've actually received, which is could a direct threat analysis apply to COVID vaccination situations? Well, let's use an example and see how COVID vaccinations, COVID itself all applies from a direct threat standpoint. This hypothetical we have up on the screen, the, the most pertinent facts, but let me explain what's going on here. Mary is a maintenance supervisor at a company called Widgets for You. Widgets for You's current COVID policy provides that employees are not required to be vaccinated, but if they are unvaccinated, so if they're not vaccinated, they need to wear a mask while working on site. No mask is necessary if the employee is working from home. Employees who are vaccinated can choose whether to wear a mask or not. 
Mary refuses to be vaccinated for personal non-religious reasons and has provided you with a doctor's note indicating that she suffers from PTSD and cannot wear a mask because of past traumatic experiences. How do you respond? So Mary's a maintenance supervisor. We have a COVID policy that requires all employees wear a mask at work if they're unvaccinated. We know Mary is unvaccinated, but we received this note that Mary has PTSD um, and that her doctor is saying that she cannot wear a mask at work. So the question becomes is, first, does Mary have a, a disability? So we're going to figure out how we, we respond. PTSD on its face is an accepted mental disability. So I don't believe that you as an organization or we need to dig any further into obtaining information concerning the medical condition itself, but we may need to have a better understanding as to the restrictions. Is it anything over her face at all or is it only over the mask? Is it only over her nose and her mouth? Um, is there other forms or fabrics that could be placed there that don't elicit the PTSD response? Understanding what exactly it is about the mask itself that's causing um, the PTSD um, symptoms to um, occur is an important thing to understand. So while we may not need further information about the disability itself, we may need to understand how our policy is interacting with um, the perceived limitations that she has. So that's the first thing is we may need to get a better understanding of them. We then are going to take the employee's job description. So she's a maintenance supervisor. And we're also gonna take the COVID policy. And we're gonna review both of those documents together to understand how Mary's disability potentially forecloses or interferes with her ability um, to follow the current policy or to do an essential function of the job. In this situation, it doesn't appear as though we have an interference with the ability to do the essential functions of Mary's job, that is being the maintenance supervisor, but it does relate to her ability to do the essential functions of being the maintenance supervisor as it relates to the COVID policy, as she's indicating that she cannot be masked. So we know that the policy, however, built into it already provides an alternative. And the alternative being you could be vaccinated. So if you're vaccinated, you wouldn't have to wear a mask. Can we respond and say your options are one, wear a mask or two, be vaccinated and we're not going to accept or consider any other accommodations or dialogue? thoughts, opinions, you can use chat, you can use the Q&A. No, we're still going to need to have a dialogue. Granted, our policy itself already has the second option, but we're going to need to determine, okay, she can't wear a mask and she also is choosing not to be vaccinated. Is there another option that, that is available? what are some of those things that, that they would be. So our next step is to brainstorm and to consider what other options are available. And in this situation, I like to have a very open dialogue about all the possibilities. Um, so what about, could she work remotely? Probably not because maintenance supervisors require physical presence and hands-on work at the location. Could she wear a face shield? Now the face shield would not interact with, potentially would not interact with any feelings of suffocation that she may be experienced um, connected to the PTSD. But we also know under the CDC guidance that a face shield is not providing the same protection to the individual or to third parties as the face mask would. So that's so when that direct threat situation is going to come into effect, if we, if we had the individual wearing a face shield as opposed to a mask, would they pose a direct threat to other individuals within the organization, right? 
Maybe. And that's when the science becomes extremely important to understand and to base our decision off of what current science is. Um, based on CDC guidance, we know that a face mask doesn't decrease spread, but we also know that vaccinated individuals can similarly spread COVID. And currently our policy isn't requiring unvaccinated, isn't requiring vaccinated individuals to wear a mask. So could an argument be that the appropriate accommodation would simply permit her to be unvaccinated and not wear a mask at work? that's going to come down to an analysis of what the current science looks like and what kind of a direct threat she would be to herself and to other individuals within the organization if she's unmasked. Is there a way for us to social distance her and make sure she's not coming into contact with other individuals. Um, she's a maintenance supervisor, so she's moving throughout the place. It would be very difficult for us to keep her in one location. I think that there's a good based off of a direct threat and that we can't accommodate her request um, because we need her to be masked. She can't work remotely, all of those different elements. Let's move on to hypothetical two real quick and, and get through that one. And then we're gonna jump to a religious accommodation dialogue. So in hypothetical two, um, we have an injury. John was in a work-related car accident and that has resulted in a back injury and it's placed him out of work. We recently, however, got a doctor's recommendation and three weeks after the accident, John's doctor released him to return to work at 20% capacity. Your worker's comp provider asks you to return him to work. Okay, we've got notice that he can do some work. Let's get him back into work. Now, in response, how are we going to respond to both John, John's doctor, and the worker's comp provider? In this situation, worker's comp is pushing to get him back to work, right? But the thing is that 20% capacity, we need to look at the job duties and responsibilities. And it's highly likely that John's not gonna be able to perform all the ascensions, essential functions of his position. So should we return him to work? The answer is no, because if we return him to work only doing 20% of the work, in other situations in the future, when we have comparator situations, we would have to allow people to work by only doing 20% of their job. That would result in taking away essential functions of the position and therefore kind of decrease the effectiveness of the position and require you to have two people doing the same job. So this would become an undue burden in most situations. So the individual isn't even qualified for the position itself because they can only do 20% and there's no duty or requirement that we remove essential functions from the position. Well, we've, you know, in a real quick 33 minutes, we ran through disabilities under the ADA, how to accommodate them, best practices and a couple of hypotheticals. But as you all know, um, accommodating disabilities isn't the only obligations that organizations have. Liz, let's talk a little bit about religious accommodations and our obligations under Title VII. Thanks, Tawny. Um, yeah, so employers, in addition to accommodating uh, employee disabilities, also have a duty to accommodate um, employees to sincerely held religious beliefs. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what that means, uh, what a sincerely held religious belief is, as well as um, some information and best practices on how you can accommodate uh, religious beliefs as needed um, in accordance with the law. So where do these protections come from? Uh, so Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is the federal employment law that sets forth that prohibition on religious discrimination in the workplace. And as part of this prohibition um, on discrimination, it requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations for sincerely held religious beliefs, um, as long as there's no undue hardship on the organization. Um, it covers employers with 15 or more employees. Um, and that number is calculated based on looking at the 20 weeks in the current or preceding calendar year, 
So if you're an employer that has um, sort of a workforce that fluctuates around that number or maybe sort of skating just under or just over, uh, it's important to keep in mind that this law may apply to you um, and to uh, make sure that you know what your obligations are based on your employee account. Um, obligations against religious discrimination also come from state law as well. So even if you're an employer that doesn't qualify um, as a covered employer under the Title VII Civil Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, uh, state law, and specifically in Maine, the Maine Human Rights Act, which is the um, primary employment discrimination law, will cover you um, as far as prohibiting religious discrimination. And so when we talk about religious discrimination, um, you know, I'm sure many of you know, but this also includes, you know, harassment based on religion in the workplace, as well as retaliation um, for religious beliefs or engaging in religious practices, um, as well as requesting religious accommodations. So just keep in mind, it's, you know, discrimination is sort of an all encompassing term uh, that will apply in your workplace. So main law is a little broader in terms of the employers that it applies to. It'll cover virtually all employers in the state. Um, so you will likely be covered under the Maine Human Rights Act. Next slide, please. So what is a sincerely held religious belief? So Title VII has defined religion as including all aspects of religious observance and practice as well as belief. Um, so it's not just practices that are necessarily encompassed officially by a particular religion or church. Um, we'll, talk, we'll come back and talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but it's all aspects of religious observance and practice. But that's still not quite as clear as would be helpful, right? So what is religious? Um, what is a religion? As that, that is not defined in Title VII. Um, but the court has said that religion in this context of Title VII is a sincere and meaningful belief which occupies in the life of its possessor a place parallel to that filled by God. So part of this assessment of determining what religion is, um, you know, depends in part on how deeply a belief is held, the sincerity of that belief, and whether it's part of a system that's um, not equivalent to, but sort of uh, looks like religion um, or what we typically believe religion to constitute in somebody's life. Again, not super specific, not super helpful. And it's a pretty broad term. It's, it's fairly open-ended. And it's important to remember that in the context of Title VII, you know, we're talking about religion that's both organized and unorganized. Um, religions that are common, that you may have heard of, be familiar with, as well as those that are less common, uh, maybe you haven't heard of, maybe you don't necessarily agree with. Uh, the, you know, the religion need not be acceptable, logical, consistent, or comprehensible to others, um, is the standard we've seen used in assessing whether something constitutes a religion. So it is very broad and, you know, just because it's not something that you've heard of before or agree with or can relate to, doesn't necessarily mean it's not covered. A uh, religion also doesn't have to be theistic or centered around having a God or some primary, um, primary God figure, uh, despite the quote by the court above. Um, it can be a set of moral and ethical beliefs that are held with the strength of traditional religious views. Again, sort of trying to create um, a sense of what constitutes religion based on what we, what we sort of more colloquially understand as religion. But that said, um, political or social or economic beliefs our philosophies um, aren't necessarily going to be protected as religion under Title VII. Uh, we really need to focus on whether an employee has a belief system um, rather than when they're focusing on isolated teachings um, and also the employee's motivation for engaging in practices or activities, um, whether those uh, practices are based in a religious faith um, or tied to a religion versus uh, purely secular reasons. Next slide, please. So, you know, these are still sort of fuzzy concepts. So I wanna give you a few examples um, to help illustrate some of these principles. So the first is called the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Um, maybe some of you have heard about this. It certainly, I think, sounds unconventional if you haven't heard of it, 
but this is a church that started gaining notoriety around 2005 um, in response to the Kansas School Board debating about teaching intelligent design and evolution in schools. Um, so that's when this really started to become um, more widely known. But it's a, you know, if you, if you look it up, it is a, they operate as a church or they appear to operate as a church. Um, they have a written gospel. Um, they have teachings uh, about when the universe was created. Um, they uh, allege that pirates are the chosen people of the flying spaghetti monster. Um, the religion circles around the flying spaghetti monster as the deity of the church. Um, and they have a set of moral standards that their followers apply to or uh, adhere to. And they actually have uh, churches organized in many European countries and you can become an ordained uh, member of the church. So let's say you're in a situation where you have an employee come to your office. Um, they are wearing a spaghetti strainer on their head and they're asking to uh, be permitted to dress as a pirate. And they tell you that they need Fridays off as a religious holiday because these are, these are things that people have requested um, in accordance with the teachings of the church. Mm -hmm. Do you have to accommodate these requests? Uh, you know, it's not a traditional religion, but as we know, we don't, it doesn't necessarily need to be. And I can't give you an entirely clear answer on that um, based on, you know, sort of the flexibility of the standard and the way the courts looked at it. I can tell you that Utah, Massachusetts, and Wisconsin, um, their DMVs have actually allowed um, pastafarians, which is what the people in the church call themselves, to wear uh, spaghetti strainers on their head in their driver's license photos, um, you know, because it's being asserted as a religious belief. It actually has been addressed by one court as well as to whether the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is a religion. Um, in that case, it was a prisoner asserting that they were being suppressed in their religious expression. And the court did determine that this wasn't a religion uh, in, the ter in terms of the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. So not Title VII, but they did analyze whether it's a religion. Uh, they determined it's not a belief system addressing a deep and ponderable ma matters um, including humankind's sense of being, purpose of life, and place in the universe, uh, and that it was more of a parody. But that's not necessarily dispositive. Um, so again, I'm not, you know, sort of posing this as an example of religion you might not have heard of uh, that might seem like something non-traditional, and it's not entirely, you know, clear under law whether whether an employer would have to accommodate a request under this um, belief system. So let's compare that to another case, um, cozy kitten cat food. And that's a situation where an employee uh, sued their employer and said that they were being discriminated against because of their religion, uh, which was based on the fact that cozy kitten cat food um, contributed significantly to a state of well being. And so that was his personal religious creed um, because it helps relate to his work performance. Uh, the court said that that did not uh, constitute religious belief because a belief in pet food uh, did not qualify legally as a religion. So that was more of a personal preference. Um, so a couple interesting examples of how courts have interpreted those. So in addition to the assessment of whether a belief is religious in nature, uh, we also need to look at whether the belief is sincerely held. Um, so that's another prong of the test. You know, if an employee makes a request based on religion, um, but if the employee isn't sincerely holding that belief, rather just asserting it, it doesn't necessarily warrant an accommodation, um, you, you know, granting an accommodation for that employee. So this is, as the EEOC has said, largely a matter of individual credibility, which is one way of saying it's a case-by-case -case basis. So when you get a religious accommodation request, you do need to analyze whether it's sincerely held on you know, an individual basis, depending on the employee. And there's a number of factors that um, employers can consider. So generally evidence tending to show that an employee acted in a manner inconsistent with their professed religious beliefs. Um, so if you have an employee coming to work um, saying that they need a certain accommodation, if they've been acting inconsistently with that request um, up until that point, that might be a basis to question whether the belief is sincerely held. Uh, looking at whether the accommodation um, is for a particularly desirable benefit. Um, 
you know, if you have an employee asking for a certain day off during the week, um, you know, some employees might need Saturdays off for a religious reason, that is a sincerely held belief. And others might just want Saturdays off to spend time with their family. So that's one thing to look at in terms of assessing whether it's sincerely held. Another thing you can consider is timing. Um, so if, if, you know, there's a particular policy going into effect or, um, you know, current happenings going on in your workplace and then that triggers an accommodation request, you can consider that timing and figuring out whether the belief is sincerely held. Next slide, please. And if, you know, in going through this analysis, as an employer, you find that there is a basis to question um, the religious nature of an employee's alleged belief or practice or the sincerity of that belief or practice, you do have a right to seek additional information. Um, so this can be following up with the employee in a conversation, requesting documentation, um, both from the employee as well as from religious leaders or um, other persons with whom the employee interacts. Um, you can ask for additional information to help support uh, you know, the nature of the belief, what they believe, um, and, you know, history of their participation in that belief uh, to help figure out whether it's sincerely held. It, employers are allowed to dig to an extent. Um, the extent to which the digging can go, that's a little bit of a gray area. Um, so there's no, you know, really specific guidance from the EEOC, but you know, you are allowed to investigate a little bit further, um, but I would caution, you know, digging to a degree where it becomes a potential discrimination issue in itself, right? So um, making sure to still treat the employer respectfully and um, give them uh, credibility sort of as needed in the situation um, in determining whether the belief is sincerely held. So a couple other points to consider, um, employees may have recently adopted their religious beliefs. So, you know, we talked on the earlier slide about looking to whether an employee has acted inconsistently with their currently asserted religious belief, um, but they also could have adopted uh, the religious belief between that time and the current time. Um, so it's not, you know, sort of an end all be all if there's inconsistency uh, with the way that they've behaved in the past. Um, Another thing to consider is that the law doesn't require that an employee follow all tenets of religion, um, or you know they might also follow more tenets than are required by religion. Um, so if you you know have an employee who's making a request under a certain religion, but maybe they're not engaging in every practice that's traditionally um, required by that religion, or they're engaging in actions that are um, you know prohibited by that religion. Again, it's not necessarily dispositive as to the you know, genuineness to which they hold those religious beliefs um, because they are allowed to take some but not others, uh, tenants of those religions. And just Next. to add to that, Liz, it, it's important to understand that you don't have to follow what the leader of that religion says. So while the Dalai Lama might say um, Buddhists should be vaccinated, if a Buddhist says that, that they don't want to be vaccinated because of their own spiritual belief, that still could be a sincerely held religious belief. Same with, with Catholics who um, the, the Pope has said you should be vaccinated and there's no problem with, with receiving the vaccine, um, a personal choice still, um, even if it conflicts with the leader of the organization, still can be a sincerely held religious belief. Yep. And um, we can jump to the next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so assessing the need for an accommodation. So the need for religious accommodation um, might come up in a variety of different ways. Um, often it's the employee bringing something to the attention of a supervisor or human resources department, um, or potentially it is a supervisor uh, or HR department, department noticing something about an employee um, that might trigger a consideration of whether they need an accommodation. Um, but once you get that request, uh, you know, that's when the interactive process starts, which Emily talked about in terms of disability, and it does look fairly similar in the context of religion. Um, the key question is gonna be whether an employee's religious belief interferes with their ability to perform their job. 
Uh, so mm -hmm. step one of that is determining, of course, whether the employee has a sincerely held religious belief, which we've talked about. And then sort of taking that, um, setting it on one side and then looking at the employee's job, uh, looking at the essential functions, um, sort of what the employer's policy is that there's um, a conflict with and figuring out the precise nature of that conflict. So really, I think pinpointing the that crosshair of where the religious belief interferes with the policy or practice of the employer is really key to making sure that you're identifying a reasonable accommodation targeted to the conflict. Um, so I wanna talk about presumptions also, um, because while the need for religious accommodation does often come up when an employee brings it up and, and you know, there's a discussion about it, there doesn't necessarily need to be actual knowledge um, of the employer of the religious belief to create liability here. So one case um, that dealt with this issue was EEOC versus Abercrombie and Fitch stores. And this was a case a few years ago uh, where an employee wore a headscarf to their interview at Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, the interviewer was impressed by her, but the, that they were concerned about the fact that the applicant was wearing a headscarf and told her manager that she thought uh, the applicant was wearing it for religious reasons. Uh, the applicant never said anything about wearing the headscarf for religious reasons though. So Abercrombie um, ultimately didn't hire this applicant. Um, and also it's important to know that Abercrombie had a policy against wearing caps or, or headpieces like this um, as part of their dress code. So when Abercrombie got sued um, for denying this person employment on the basis of religion, one of their primary arguments was that um, they didn't have actual knowledge that the applicant would need an accommodation based on religion uh, to wear the headscarf because they didn't bring it up during the interview. But the court um, ultimately held that, that was not relevant to the analysis. So because Abercrombie presumed that the applicant would need a religious accommodation, um, that would impute liability for religious discrimination all the same, even though they didn't know expressly from the employee or the applicant in this case. Um, so the bottom line is that regardless of whether you're told about an employee's need for accommodation based on religion or whether you assume that there's a need for accommodation based on religion, if you act adversely to that employee, um, you know, on that basis, that can make you potentially liable. And next slide, please. So just to run through a couple examples of what reasonable accommodations might be. Um, one type of accommodation that we see in this context often is dress code uh, accommodations, sort of like the potential accommodation in the Abercrombie case. Um, so if there's a, a dress code prohibiting employees from wearing headwear, um, but an employee needs to due to religious reasons, a reasonable accommodation could be potentially making an, uh, an exception to that dress code. Uh, modified schedules is another uh, type of accommodation we see, whether it be uh, providing the Sabbath off when possible, if, if that's requested by an employee, or providing break times for prayer, um, those could be reasonable accommodations. Um, permitting religious displays, same thing at an employee's work area, if there's typically a rule against uh, displaying such items. Um, but it is important to keep in mind what's unreasonable. Um, unreasonable accommodations would be ones that don't address that conflict. So like we were talking about, that's why it's important to really identify what the issue is and what the policy and procedure is that's causing conflict, um, as well as avoiding accommodations that would disadvantage the employee. So one example of that would be um, if an employee needs a day off to uh, observe a religious holiday, um, you know, if we typically allow employees to take, you know, paid leave for Christmas, um, then providing a different religious holiday uh, with unpaid leave would not necessarily be a reasonable accommodation because it's disadvantaging um, an employee based on their particular religious observance. Um, so that would be unreasonable. And next slide, please. 
And next, of course, is the undue hardship analysis. Um, so this is, again, similar to the type of analysis that you do in the disability context. Um, but you know, accommodations don't need to be made if they would cause undue hardship to the employer. So it's really, again, a case by case assessment of making sure that you, um, you know, are, are figuring out what, what would ne be needed to make the accommodation, um, what's reasonable in light of your workplace. So nature of your workplace, whether um, the uh, accommodation would, you know, have a significant financial impact. Uh, whether it would impact your business operations. And another important one um, that we're seeing, you know, really at issue lately is whether the accommodation would violate or conflict with another law. And, you know, a classic example, maybe not classic, but becoming classic, uh, is whether, you know, there's a law requiring a COVID vaccine, um, you know, and how a religious accommodation request would you know, or maybe would um, require the employer to be in violation with the mandate or under state or federal law. So those are the types of considerations that can render, um, that can result in the undue hardship uh, to the employer. And next slide. Great, thanks, Liz. Let's jump in real quick about some of the best practices which are similar but slightly different when we're talking about religious accommodations. So first, we need to ask for more information if we don't understand or have reason to believe that a religious practice or belief may adversely interact with a policy or practice. So this goes to the example that Liz gave regarding the Abercrombie case. So specifically by, by viewing the individual, you couldn't tell what their religion was, but you had a, a reason to believe that potentially a religious belief could interfere with a current policy or practice. Again, important to have strong up-to-date job descriptions so we can determine what a potential undue burden would look like. Um, recall that for religious accommodations, there is no um, provision concerning um, direct threat. We're only looking at whether or not it's an undue burden. Now, does the direct threat analysis come into play in determining whether or not there's an undue burden? Maybe, depending on the situation and in COVID, that might be the case, but there's not a specific direct threat um, exemption from religious accommodations. Um, we should have a religious accommodation policy that clearly sets out the steps employees should take if they're seeking a religious accommodation. This is something that more and more Emily, Liz, and I are, are helping companies create because prior to um, the pandemic, they did not have one in place. And then again, understanding comparator data and individuals who um, are seeking exemptions um, and making sure that we treat people the same. Let's really quickly in the last three minutes run through a couple of hypos. So the first hypothetical, hypothetical A, um, Mary complains to you that she is disgusted by John's lifestyle and how he flaunts it at work. Um, John is gay, and he has images of his husband and children on his desk. Mary and John are co-workers. They sit in the same pod. Mary believes that marriage should only be between a man and a woman and homosexuality is a sin. She has asked you to remove John from the pod because looking at the pictures of him with his husband's with his husband makes it difficult for her to focus. John and Mary are both in the marketing department, a department that is made up of four individuals who all sit in the same pod. This design has been set up to increase engagement and creativity between the team. Moving John or Mary would decrease the team's overall performance. Having Mary or John remote, working remotely would similarly decrease engagement and creativity. Can you ask John to take down the pictures of his husband? No, unless we're going to tell everyone that they need to not have personal pictures in their work environment. There is nothing objectively offensive about uh, John's picture with his, wife, with his husband on his desk. They're not 
semi-nude so we don't have an issue concerning sexual harassment we don't have any other vulgar activity so just because mary doesn't like seeing what john's family unit is doesn't mean that we can interfere with um john's rights as an individual now if we wanted to create a policy overarching that said nobody can have pictures of their family in the office we could do that but we can't single out um, john and say you can't have pictures on your desk because that would be a form of discrimination against john as a result of his sexual orientation so there are going to be situations in which an employee's um, religious beliefs could interfere with individuals um, who fall within another protected class category, it is considered an undue burden to have to violate the rights of another in order to comply with the religious tenets of an individual. The same thing would happen, let's do a similar situation, you hire someone and after you've hired them, they say, my religious beliefs restrict my interaction with individuals of the opposite sex, so I will not speak to, email, or otherwise engage with somebody who is not of the same sex or gender as, as I am. In most situations, that's going to constitute an undue burden, and it's not something that you're going to be able to accommodate. Uh, we're one minute over. We're going to do one really quick hypothetical, and then we're going to be done um, because this one relates to COVID. So your company's instituted a vaccine mandate. Employees must be vaccinated by December 20th unless they're granted a religious or medical accommodation. Mary has requested a religious accommodation, noting that her religious beliefs foreclose use of drugs that are under an emergency use authorization and that used fetal cells in their development. She believes that life begins at creation and that her higher power has provided her with an adequate immune system. How do you respond? There's a couple of things here that get very confusing. And one of them is, is she's referencing the emergency use authorization. That's going to be a science basis for refusing the vaccine, not a religious basis, but she is tying it into the use of fetal cells. Now, an argument can be made that only one of the vaccines and its development used fetal cells. However, there's a more expansive argument that can be made that the research that was used in order to create um, the vaccines focused or included foundational data and research that used fetal cells. If that's the case, our next step that we would recommend would be to go back to the individual or employee and understand whether or not they are partaking in activities or behaviors that would additionally um, support this the sincerity of this belief. So are they taking ibuprofen? Have they taken Midol? All of these other drugs that were developed using a foundation with fetal cell tech uh, science um, becomes a, a big part of the dialogue. And if the individual says, yes, I'm using all of these, but it's because I didn't know about it and moving forward, I won't use it, then there's a good chance that we're going to have to um, accommodate the individual's religious request. If, however, we do a quick Facebook scan and we see her posting on Facebook saying, yeah, I'd get the vaccine if I knew it was going to protect me and I couldn't get COVID from it. Or if you could show me somebody who, um, uh, who hasn't um, gotten COVID and were promised not to get it after we get this vaccine, that goes against a religious belief because that's saying the reason I'm not being vaccinated isn't because of a religious belief with regards to fetal cells. It's because I don't believe in the science behind it. So that would decrease the sincerity of the religious belief. We do a lot of analysis when we're looking at the sincerity of the belief itself, especially when it relates to COVID and the vaccine. I apologize to everyone. We are three minutes over. Thank you all for your attention. Um, we did get some questions throughout it. Um, please reach out to Emily, Liz, or I if you have any follow-up questions. Liz and Emily, any final words? Uh, no, but thank you everybody again for uh, attending. Thank you all.